Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 240. I'm delighted to be joined on the podcast today by Mark Gillette. Mark, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Ben. Uh, Thanks for having me on. No, not at all. It's great to have you on the podcast. Anyone that doesn't know, you've probably seen in the graphic as as the podcast goes out, Mark is the Chief Medical Officer at the Premier League. So thank you very much for coming on, Mark. Let's have a little chat to start with. What yeah. led up to this role? I always like to dig into people's backgrounds and careers. So what what was um, what came before this role that you're in right now? So I've been a doctor a long time now, uh, nearly 30 years. So it gives you an idea of, well, over 30 years, gives you an idea of how, how old I am. Uh, so I trained um, in emergency medicine. So I trained in emergency medicine and dual trained in sports medicine. So I worked in the NHS as a consultant uh, three or four, three or four years, and then um, I got invited to be one of the medical team for the first team at Chelsea uh, in two thousand and eight. So I was there for a couple of years. Um, I'm Midlands based, um, and then two years after that, um, Dan Ashworth uh, invited me to come back um, to work at West Brom. You know, as part of um, their performance setup. So I was there for uh, eight or nine years, uh, initially as, as head of medical and then as director of performance, which led me um, to this job um, four or five years ago now. Awesome. Brilliant. And now I wanted to ask, what does your day to day look like now? I'm sure that's changed over the few different roles. Yeah. But what's it all like right now? So I spend most of my day today is spent looking after patients. So uh, um, I'm a busy clinical doctor. You know, I run four or five clinics a week. Um, and then my work for the Premier League sort of fits in around that. Um, most of the time, it's pretty flexible. Um, but clearly when, you know, there's crises as during COVID or times like that, there, there's a lot more to be done. Um, so most of my week is spent seeing patients and then I supplement that with the management stuff that I do for the Premier League. Brilliant. And a big chunk of your week is now taking up on a bike, which... I feel like another job, yes. <laughs> it's worse than another job. So, um, you know, I'm cycling all 21 stages of the Tour de France in four and a half weeks to try and raise money for Gula King, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I say amazing. I'm I'm not jealous in terms of the actual the, the event that you're going to be doing, but absolutely brilliant cause. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll send over all the links and everything. You can check out um, that in the show notes. But one thing I wanted to talk about today, Mark, obviously a big part of the training, which how long did you say you've got left as we record this? Is it four weeks until you four go? Four and a half weeks. So um, June the 23rd in Bilbao is when we start. Brilliant. And when did the training start? Um, training started probably, so I, you know, I'm a, I've been cycling for a while anyway, um, uh, but uh, I've got a coach in September, so he's been setting my programs um, since that time, uh, initially three rides a week, and now it's an awful lot more than that, so, um, you know, it's, it's a good eight months of endeavour putting into this. And who was it who came up with the idea, Matt? So it's Jeff Thomas's charity. So Kulu King, yeah, they do it every year. Um, you may have seen the documentaries on YouTube and NBC do. So the aim is 25 people, 25 riders, raising a, raising a million pounds between us uh, to uh, support trials in clinical care for people with, with leukemia. And, and, and this year in particular, they're very keen to support adolescent treatment. So it's um, you know, even more important we raise the money this time. Amazing, amazing. Well, I urge people to go and check it out. But we wanted to cover on this podcast, you've been working with, closely with one of our partners, Hytro. Yeah. Um, so just to kick off, what was your previous experience in terms of BFR, blood, blood flow restriction training? Did you have any, like, what yeah. was your approach to that before? So, um, we used it a lot uh, when I was working with, uh, in the Premier League with players. So, you know, certainly as a performance adjunct um, or as a rehabilitation uh, element, you know, we've something that I've, I've used a lot and I've been impressed with the results. Uh, I try obviously, uh, the aim is you can apply the pressure yourself. Um, it's a very good product. I'm not just saying that because they've helped me a lot, but it, but it is a good product. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's been lots of applications in my training, probably in terms of recovery is where I use it most. 
although you know I've got a little bit of an injury issue at the moment, so again I think you know I'll be using that to try and get over the injury and train um, at some level, even though you know my hamstrings a little bit tight. I wanted to get into some of the protocols that you've used with the hydro kit in a second, but also just previously when you said about having previous experience with BFR and working with players, you said in the rehab setting is one, but also the performance setting. So has that been more of like your finisher type of exercises? How's that actually looked with, with players? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you're always very conscious in a busy football programme, a Premier League programme, in that um, there's always that balance between loading and reducing the chance of contractile injury, which is, you know, what it, it, it is a fundamental part of running a medical department. And then not overstepping that and making sure I'm uh, uh, making a player fatigue going into games. Um, so that's always that balance. And it's always, you know, something that medical teams will be debating about how they best balance that. And I think the um, advantage of BFR is it's suboptimal loading um, and you can do it quickly and you can do it in a measured fashion. So, um, you know, we, we used it a lot in that sort of Thursday setting when you're trying to get that new... Um, you're a uh, dry before a game, but you don't really want to overload a player by getting him to lift too heavy 48 hours before a game. And was that done with the old school sort of blood pressure cuff and, and all that before, yeah. before hydro, yeah. pre-hydro? So, you know, so I left West Brom in 2018, I think. So hydro would have been at a very, um, very young stage then if it, if, it, if it existed at all. So yeah, it was obviously in that Premier League setting when you've got coaches, uh, it was done with a cuff. Brilliant. And then in terms of why Hydro, why why did you why did you choose to work with those guys? I mean, I think um the evidence base is very good. Um I, I clearly um they're credible scientists um and they take a lot of pride in the scientific uh, basis of their products. Um they've been very helpful to me, you know. I think um certainly in terms of cycling, we're at an early stage when we're talking about BFR. Uh, implementation um so you know it's uh it's been a useful two-way process which is ongoing brilliant if you were to describe it Matt, to someone that's maybe not used bfr at all and yeah. then so describing bfr in, in in one instant but then also describing the actual kit and hopefully we'll, we'll add some um visual aid to this as well where yeah. people can actually see what the hydro kit is like sure. how would you describe that to people I think um, it's one of those things that people feel a little bit apprehensive about if they've never done it. Um, and that, uh, interestingly, that goes for medical professionals as well. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, surgeons in particular, post-operatively, um, intuitively thinking about reducing blood supply to limbs is uh, a, a particularly risky practice. But the aim is obviously that you um, occlude, partially occlude the blood supply to uh, the upper limb or lower limb. You're then working uh, those muscles um, at a reduced oxygen supply, a reduced oxygen flux. So um, the muscles are working harder and you can work them harder to get uh, an increased effect. And historically, um, it's um, something we've used to get uh, an increase in muscle size. So you know, that's how we started using it um, before we started looking at the performance applications. When you first put it on, it feel a bit strange. It's a bit like having your blood pressure taken. Um, it can feel a bit uncomfortable, but um, you know that's a normal feeling. And as long as you follow the protocols, then you know it works pretty well. So you mentioned before, Mark, I get about getting some good results with yeah. some players beforehand. What did that look like in terms of the results that you got? Um, I think uh, in terms of um, regaining uh, predominantly quadricep size and quadricep strength, um, either after a period of deloading, whether it be they had a tendinopathy or something like that, or after surgery, um, you know, it was something that was reliable and something tangible. And... Um, Medical teams, uh, S and C coaches, and and players liked it. So you know, it's something we used a lot. And within that, was the because I know obviously the Hydro have talked a lot about the protocols now that they they recommend, um, especially for something like that in terms of hypertrophy. What sort of protocols did you lean towards back then? 
So in those days, it was about um, inflating it to a certain pressure and working at um, a certain percentage. Of, generally, we used it body weight. Um, so number of reps at a prescribed pressure at, so depending on what your needs were, um, how many you do. So closer to the game, obviously, you do less. Um, but I think, you know, in those days, it was at a very early stages. I drove really, obviously, refined their protocols for you know, various different modalities, whether it's for, um, you know, neurogenic optimization, recovery, or uh, whether it's for um, muscle hypertrophy. There's a variety of different protocols which, uh, which, they, um, which they suggest. I mean, I really like the passive recovery. I I've spoken to the guys at ITRA about this. So certainly over the winter, um, when you're, you know, out on your bike in, in, in rain and cold for three or four hours, the passive recovery thing, coming in and having a cup of tea and sticking on the hydro shorts and sitting down was something that I, I used a lot. The other, the other um, you know, way I use it a lot at the moment is, is as, as part of a warm up. So if I'm um, warming up for you know a particularly horrible session, then I'll put hydro shorts on, uh, do some body weight squats, and you know that works pretty well. So is that more focusing towards mobility? Um, and just on top of that as well, what for anyone that's used the hydro shorts will know that there's the different numbers around the short for the different pressure. So when you're doing something like that for the warm up, what sort of pressure are you applying? Uh, no, I no, I put it right up to the top. Um, so wrap it all the way round, um, and then sets of you know 12, 15 body weight squats so that you can actually feel that sort of uh, quadricep engagement. I'm um, making sure you take it off at the right time. Um, you know, I, th I think that works pretty well. I was speaking to Warren about this uh, probably a couple of weeks ago because he was asking how to describe that feeling when you do something like squats. Or I've been playing around with um, some like low intensity on the bike, but for a fifteen minute period, and I'm not quite sure how you can how you can describe that feeling. You should have spoken to me about that first. That, that <laughs> sounds like a, a big ask. So, um... Well, it's it's pretty. Um, what's the word? It, I don't think there's too much too much like it, is there? When you're getting that sort of a pump in no. your legs, and I've spoken to Warren. Uh, so I, I think for again, you know, at the stage now where I'm probably you know training up to thirty hours a week, so there's not that not that much space to fit much more in without you know a big fatigue rollout. Um, and we used to like uh, so you know many medical teams are all talking about prescribing high speed running in a week. So if you're a Premier League team that's not playing in Europe and you have week to week then clearly you need that sort of high-speed running prescriptive dose, which protects you from injury and optimizes you for the weekend. Um, and I do think there's an element of that in cycling as well. So, you know, we've been playing around with, you know, what sort of reps, what sort of wattage, uh, what sort of um, percentage of your maximum power output um, you, you find you derive a benefit from um, early stages. But I think there will be a lot in that for busy cyclists and busy, busy triathletes. Definitely. So just back on the recovery side, obviously leaning towards that passive recovery, which I, I don't know if you've used it. Have you used is the five minute, two minute protocol? Is that the sort of thing yeah. you've been leaning towards? Yeah, that's what I do. So roughly, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'll put it on and I actually probably won't thank me for this, but I, you know, I, I put it on and, and, and I leave it on for about five minutes, take it off, walk around. So I'm not slave to it. Um, well, you know, it's it's very much part of my routine, and it's certainly something that I notice if I don't do it. Is that, and then what do you notice? Is it is it more muscle soreness? Like, what's the difference? Yeah. You think? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely your quads feel um, more ready to go if you use it regularly. Yeah. Um, I, I think subjectively, um, you know, most people will say that. I mean, it's used by a lot of uh, professional sports teams in that capacity when you go down the bus. Um, and I think, you know, they're, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of use in that. Yeah, that passive side, like they, they've mentioned before, haven't they, that it can be done on team buses in changing yeah. rooms, yeah. Um, just away from the pitch. Players don't really have to do anything apart from yeah. literally strap into the short. And you can do multiple things, can't you? So because you're not stuck to a machine, a game ready or something like that, you can walk around, you can refuel, you can rehydrate, um, you know, you can go into a tactical meeting, debrief, all those things, which, I mean, there's a lot to do to recover from, a, you know, from an event. It sounds a pretty obvious question with the, the event actually being a bike ride, but 
In, have you played around with any of the upper body stuff as well? Um, not really. I mean, I've done it a couple of times when I'm so frustrated that I've got enough time to go to the gym, and I, I've done it a few times, but not um, not religiously. Um, part of the reason is that you know, obviously, body weight needs to be as minimal as possible for a, a, an injury at event like that. So, um, yeah, I'm a bit worried that my spindly body will recover after this event. So, I, I, I could see me using it after the event, definitely. Yeah, yeah, you definitely don't want to be packing on too much, too much muscle before going, do you? Um, with the difference, because you mentioned about previously using BFR before yeah. and some of the results that you've got, compared, I'm not just saying this because Pietro is a sponsor of our podcast and you've been working with them, but what what are some of the things you found with the difference with the actual the kit and the, the equipment they've got in terms of the the um width of the strap and everything, the comfort compared yeah. to like the blood pressure cuffs and what we used to use well obviously it's a lot easier to use and i think it's easier for um as long as they follow the protocols it's safe to use uh, without coaching supervision so um you know i think that's a really valuable um uh sort of really valuable usage um the garments are pretty well made um you know, they, they they last a, a good while even though um so mine is still intact even though i've been using them every day for about four months um so i think uh you know that there's a lot of usability and reliability and robustness about the product if people are listening Matt, and they either want to try it themselves yeah. What would your advice be to them? Uh, well, I, I tackle that one first. Well, I mean, I think, um, so read about it, know what it does, be realistic about it, and have a plan about how you'd use it. So, um, you know, so a lot of people are going to do you like you do, get on a bike for 15 minutes with a strap, which is which is probably going to put people off for life, because you know, <laughs> sure there's too many people who would do that. Um <laughs> You're much better off doing it for a period of time at a known output, so a known, known power output, recovering properly, and probably in the early stages, you know, have a little bit of a longer recovery between bouts so that you get used to it. Um, and you get used to that feeling that um, blood flow restriction gives you. Because one one that they do talk about is like the 30, 15, 15... 15 protocol isn't it like a as a body weight exercise so it's always a good place for people to start just to get through yeah. those sets like you said you're not putting as much as much sort of load um yeah. through that exercise even to body weight so it's yeah. always a good place to start that and it, and like you mentioned before you mentioned about the mobility or using it at, at the start of a session i think that's a great point for anyone that hasn't had that experience before so I think there's probably um, two groups of non-professional uh, athletes who might use it. One is that uh, the people who um, are probably time poor um, and don't have enough time to get to the gym and have to do some body weight work so you can use upper and, upper and lower body. And I think that can work really well if you follow uh, the protocols. The other, I think, uh, uh, are sort of the... Um, uh, sort of the amateur people like me who are chasing a goal and looking for that performance optimization. And I do think, particularly with a lower limb garment, that um, in terms of deriving your maximum power output, that there's a lot to be at. So, you know, I've spoken to Warren about this. You know, when I do a, a horrible threshold set, which is generally anything between, you know, 10, 10, to, 10 to 20 minute blocks with recovery time, um generally when i get into the third one it's my quads that fail you know so my heart rate doesn't get any higher in fact it will start to go down because it's sort of peripheral failure i get and i really think that you know blood flow restriction could really be um a good tool to try and develop that over a period of time yeah that's a great point the other thing i was going to ask mark is for practitioners if they're listening at clubs I know there's a lot of clubs now invested in using the hydro, the hydro kit, especially for recovery. Yeah. Where do you sort of, with your experience in the game, where is it you feel it can have the biggest input? Do you think it is the recovery side of things or, or elsewhere? Um, well, I think it is useful for recovery. Um, and I think um, perhaps uh, in that preparation stage, um, you know, in the 24 hours before a game where you want to do, you want to have some load, but you want that load to be very controlled. I think, you know, that there 
is definitely an application in there because um, again, it's multiple. You might be traveling, you might be doing something on the pitch the day before a game. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of application in that. And when you approach the event, Mark, you get into the event, what's your use of high going to look like then? Is it going to be the same as what you've been doing? I know people always well, say I'm not to change so. preparation. So, but that, that's predicating the fact that I'm actually coherent at the end of uh, <laughs> the ride. Um, so the plan is I will use it. Um, I think, um, you know, the things that I've always found helpful for me have been, you know, cold water immersion. So as cold as possible is as soon as possible. And that's not always not going to be not always going to be possible. Um compression works quite well. And um now BFR is something on top of also your yeah, hydration and, and nutrition of course. Um uh, you know so the, the the way the Tour de France works is that you finish at a certain point, you might have a long bus ride to the next stage, so the overnight stop. So the plan and is uh, when I get on that bus, um, I'll be putting the shorts on and following the recovery protocol. So that's the plan. Brilliant. That's if you remember what shorts are or know where your legs are and all the rest I am, of it. Where I am and uh, what I'm supposed to be doing. So, <laughs> you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Amazing, Matt. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Can you give any details? Is there going to be any sort of way that people can follow what's going on with, with um, the there event? Is. Um, so if you go onto the Q Leukemia uh, website, um, uh, that, that will tell you everything you need to know. There's a series of documentaries that they'll put onto YouTube during the tour, which will be helpful. Um, and uh, you can follow it at uh, an Instagram at the Tour 21 um, or follow me on Twitter at Dr. Mark Gillette. Dot March let on Twitter. So, you know, all those sort of things. Um, I'll let you know how we're getting on. Brilliant. That's impressive that you're going to be riding and tweeting. Uh, no, no, that'll be <laughs> at the end of the day. So that'll be another thing for me to remember. Yeah, don't stack too many things at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Amazing cause. And I hope people do get behind you, which I'm sure they will. Um, thank you for coming on and discussing that. I'm sure people will take a lot from it. We've hope hopefully made it relatable, not just for the event that you've got coming up, but also for people in their roles or any sort of interest in BFR. So thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Ben. Cheers.